we're going to continue our study in the book of Revelation. We're in chapter 14. And Lord willing, we're going to cover verses 6 through 13. 6 through 13. This is the eighth lesson in the drama of the ages 3. Drama of the ages 3, lesson number 8. The doomsday clock is not an actual clock, of course, but is more of a concept relating to man's capability to destroy himself and how close he is to doing that. The people that decide where the doomsday clock is positioned is not a partisan group. They have moved it back or forwards, closer to midnight, depending on how you look at it, uh, an equal number of times during Democratic and Republican uh, administrations, so there's not a political agenda that's involved there. The clock was created in 1947, and its first setting was seven minutes to midnight. Wow. Seven minutes to midnight. <clears throat> of course, midnight being the moment, supposedly, that man uh, takes action to destroy himself. The Science and Security Board meets twice a year to decide where the hands on the clock should be positioned based on a lot of different factors like climate change, uh, political trends, uh, different uh, military activity that's around the world, the various tensions. The board is made up of scientists and other experts that have extensive knowledge of nuclear technology and climate science, who will often provide expert advice to governments and international agencies. There are 16 Nobel laureates on the board. They have changed the position of the hands on the doomsday clock 22 times mm -hmm. since its creation, so they don't do it very often. The furthest away from midnight that the clock has been was in 1991 with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And the closest the hands of the clock were to midnight was in 1953 when the United States and the Soviet Union tested thermal nuclear bombs within six months of each other. More recently, the clock sat at three minutes to midnight. The recent events, such as in the past week, have prompted the board to move it to two and a half minutes to midnight. That's the closest that it has been to midnight since 1953. All of that, I think, is uh, interesting. It's interesting data and statistics and so forth. And it uh, certainly catches the attention when you talk about the doomsday clock and where it's positioned. By the way, it was not uh, during the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis in the early, early 1960s. There's no record of when that was uh, actually uh, where it was positioned on the doomsday clock because it all happened so quickly and people didn't know what was happening until after the fact, so it was never moved during that time. But as believers in Jesus Christ, we use a different standard of measurement for where the world is in reference to its past, its present, and what's going to happen in the future. So we don't go by things such as the doomsday clock. It may give us an indication of what the tensions in the world are like at that moment. Recent events suggest that there are not minutes to go before something world-changing happens, but seconds to go. That's much more likely. More than ever, international events are only confirming what God's Word has said all along. Amen. And we don't need the world's events to confirm God's Word. God's Word confirms those events. Amen. Amen. Yes, amen. So all the things that we have uh, considered as we go through the study in the challenging book of Revelation are certainly extraordinary. I don't think that they can really come as much of a surprise when we consider military, economic, social, cultural, political trends, the direction that the world is headed. The world is headed for a catastrophe called the tribulation. But before that will come the rapture of the church. We've talked about this extensively. We know how the story ends. We know where the narrative of the book of Revelation is headed, which should provide us a considerable amount of resolve and comfort. We should be very thankful that there is room for mercy in the perfect character of God. Amen. In fact, Mercy is at the center of the everlasting gospel, as is uh, referred to in verse 6 in Revelation 14, referred to as the everlasting gospel. But if there's anything that this particular angel, because it says, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. And if there's anything that this angel demonstrates, it's that God is continually reaching out to anyone and everyone that will 
consider the truth. And this means that to offer peace, he must also exercise extreme restraint. How many of you think that the world could use a little more restraint right now? Amen. Right? A little. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe another way to, uh, to put it would be appreciating the restraint of God. Yeah. You know, all of us could stand and testify and say, I'm so thankful that God exercised restraint with me at about a thousand different points in my life. Right? Amen. That, that's his mercy. It's just another way of saying mercy. Numerous uh, passages make it clear that what God has offered the world all along is what this angel of Revelation 14, 6, and 7 is actually communicating to anyone that will listen and consider. Verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory. And give glory to him, it says, For the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And that is the key thing, I think, to remember. What the angel says is what has been said all along. It is stated clearly, though the response to it is anything but clear. And it's been that way down through time. That the message is clear, but people often give a rather ambiguous response, even at best. In a way, it doesn't really matter because God is also tenacious in the truth, which will never be violated by his mercy. And it works in harmony with it. You know, you can have truth and mercy in the same breath. Yes. But sometimes people get to the point where they think that the long-suffering, patient, merciful character traits of God are a way of him fudging a little bit on the truth, and that will never happen. They work in harmony together. The success that Noah had in preaching the gospel was on the surface of pretty much a complete failure. But you could say the same thing about what Jesus did as far as the numbers go. We know that that's not true. We know that what Noah was given to do was an absolute success. Amen. And we also know what Jesus did, as we are all testifying to right now, was an absolute success. Mm -hmm. Now that can only be measured whether something is a success or failure. It can only be measured that way if the goal was to get people saved before the great flood waters came. And that was not the goal. Amen. It was to give them an opportunity to consider the different alternatives that were coming the way of the, uh, of the world. The goal was to preach and to teach the truth. And that's your goal and my goal Amen. in following Jesus Christ. And to let people decide for themselves. And that has ever been the methodology of God. And it must be the method of those that follow Him. Amen. And you know what? That involves a lot of restraint. Yes. Because you can advocate, you can speak the truth, you can promote the truth, uh, you can be a part of a, a ministry that advocates and strongly advocates God's word, and yet so often the response to what would seem to be common sense and logic just isn't there. And so that can be a little bit frustrating at times. So we have to exercise that restraint. I'm thankful that several people that I know took the time to deliver the gospel to me more than once because I didn't receive it the first time. And being raised in the church, I probably didn't receive it the 500th time. So after sermon, after sermon, after sermon, and yet my parents and the ministers that I came into contact with exercised a lot of restraint. Uh, after the fact, uh, my mother had told me, she said, we were wondering when things were going to start dawning on you. <laughs> because, uh, and you know, it, it, and it's really when you're talking about, you're talking about dealing with people, uh, it does require a lot of long-suffering attitude, yeah. a lot of patience. And if they get it the thousandth time that it's delivered to them, then it's worth it. Yes, yes. amen. And, you know, it's great if they get it the first time, but that doesn't happen too often, does it? Yeah. You know, usually it's somewhere in between. The Bible is a book of stark contrasts. And those that advocate it must ever portray it that way. We don't go for the neutral position. We don't go for the third choice. We don't go for the middle ground because those things in God's word do not exist. What does exist is the sending forth of the truth and then giving the understanding about accepting the truth or rejecting the truth and what those two choices involve and the consequences go along with it. Because there truly is no middle ground when it comes to ways of living and principles or doctrine to consider. 
as being uh, talked about here with these uh, different angels that are coming on the scene in Revelation 14. A man once uh, threatened my father when I was not present, which was good for both of us ultimately. <laughs> and though I knew that man for many years, he no longer had my respect yeah. after that. I confronted him on it later and told him, in essence, that God saved his life that day by not having him there. And probably my life as well, it worked in a different way. But that he had, I told him, I said, you better never do such a thing like that again. Wow. It'd be a fair warning. It was probably more than what was deserved, but at that moment I had to exercise a lot of restraint. It was clear enough, and I, I think so should be our stand and care of God's reputation in the eyes of the world. We should be just as avid, really more than that, uh, avid about protecting God's reputation in the eyes of this degraded world. Because the world will try to drag God's name through all of the, the sludge as long as we will allow them to do that. And so whenever we come into contact with that type of approach to God's word or a degrading of God's word, that's something that has to be dealt with directly. Amen. Uh, the ways of the world are... Uh, Contrasted to the ways of God, very starkly, very uh, very desolate, if you will, very stark. In Revelation uh, 14, 8, and there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And so here's a pronouncement of another uh, angel. Babylon is used to illustrate the way that the world is chosen. It's the ways of the world. The ways of the world are fallen. They've been exposed for what they are. The tribulation period will be very good for doing that. It'll be a very distinct uh, choices and decisions and consequences that are made that sometimes in our current setting get a little bit muddy in some people's minds. But during the tribulation, everything is pretty much being laid bare. Babylon is used again to illustrate the way the world is chosen, not just during the tribulation period, but all along, down through time. It's a worldly attitude. We can make the world better without God. That's the Renaissance. We can make the world better without God. There were even some believers at one time in the political realm that felt that we had to make the world better in order for Christ to return. And if that's the case, he's probably not going to return in about a million years because the world is not getting better. It's getting darker by the moment. Babylon, as depicted in Scripture, was a system of self-centered power that consumed anything that got in its way. Its method was to start out in subtle ways, and then once it had an opening to overwhelm those that tolerated its method to any small extent. And the re reference I gave you there in the Second Kings 20 is a reference to Hezekiah. You remember when the Babylonian representatives came to him, and they were all friendly at first. Yeah. They came as friendly ambassadors from another uh, world power or from another nation. So Hezekiah was very accommodating. How much did he show him of what uh, he had? Everything. 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 <laughs> and he didn't recognize them as the enemy that only wanted to find out what he was all about and what their nation was all about. And so the result of that, as Isaiah told him later, was because of that you will lose everything. Did they lose everything later? They did lose everything. The, the Jerusalem was basically torn apart. The nation stopped existing in one sense, at least in that particular context. Long before the so-called doomsday clock was devised, man has attempted to establish peace without God. Yet even those that determine where the clock needs to be positioned in relationship to the moment of destruction would readily admit that man's efforts thus far have been a complete failure. And as that uh, clock moves closer and closer, it's just an, another evidence of, a uh, evidence of a world that desperately needs God to set his feet on the Mount of Olives and bring order to things. In fact, most rational people would admit that the world is closer to destruction right now than it ever has been before, <laughs> even at this point. That's just a, you know, aside from all political, cultural, social, social innuendo, whatever, that's just uh, an additional confirmation of the uh, soon rapture of the church, the beginning of the tribulation to be followed by the second coming. So that's just uh, God's plan continuing to unfold as it will. Do you know who the most reserved people are about the use of military force to solve problems? Military. 
military. Yeah. Right, why is that? Because they know the cost. Anybody who's ever been in the military or been in a, a uh, theater of conflict, no horrors of it. And they understand the extreme cost of manpower and a nation's youth and strength in any type of war. And you, you get into righteous causes and yeah, that's fine. But you know, when I, it, you know, I've served in the military, Tim did, uh, Brother Corbett did of course, and uh, my wife did. And when you serve in the military and, and you get a glimpse of some of those things, you realize this has got to be the absolute last step before yeah. anything else is ever is ever taken up. And so you exhaust, you know, there's uh, even in uh, some of the potentialities of today, the ones that are sounding the greatest call for diplomacy before destruction are the generals and former generals. They're saying, whoa, no, hold on a second. We've got to take a closer look at this and explore all of the different options. Is that important? Yeah. 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 And so again, uh, when I think of uh, different uh, presidents, I think of Dwight Eisenhower. He used amazing restraint during his time in the White House because he knew firsthand what a lack of restraint could cause. I mean, you're talking about the years when the nuclear arms race was accelerating exponentially every year during the Eisenhower administration. It's interesting to think also, and I've mentioned this uh, a couple of times before, that but when Ronald Reagan came to the presidency, everybody thought, well, he's going to get us into a nuclear exchange with the Soviet Union. There wasn't anybody that was more uh, for nuclear disarmament than uh, Ronald Reagan was. But he also realized that he couldn't show weakness in the face of uh, a very potent enemy. And so when we look at things like this, we have to realize that we can be thankful that God, the Prince of Peace, will bring about peace, but you do realize also, as we look at uh, Revelation 19, much later down the road of the study, Revelation 19, that the world has chosen conflict against the Son of God. Yeah. Always has. And so that conflict continues to rage today, and then Revelation 19 it will be fully manifested, and uh, will be fully resolved too, won't it? Yeah. Aren't you glad that God doesn't use rhetoric to make his point? Amen. Right? <laughs> He doesn't use hollow threats. He doesn't use threats at all. God doesn't threat, threaten anybody. He does, do you realize that uh, God doesn't give us opinion in, God's, in, in his word? He doesn't need to. God's word is God's word. It's not his opinion. Yeah. Right? And he doesn't need to, to say words that are hollow or, or have no meaning. Rhetoric equating to words without substance. Amen. It gets you into trouble. Yeah. God deals in truth. And he deals with the giving of clear choices Amen. for us to understand. He says, you know, this can be, there can be peace between us, he says to each one of us. God says, the living God of the universe says to you and I as individuals, there can be peace between us. But the choice is yours. Yeah. Yeah. Please remember that what happens during the tribulation period is only a visual, physical manifestation is what been taking, of, of what has been taking place spiritually for many generations. So it's, it's finally being manifested. Amen. You know, I've said this uh, a couple times here recently, you know, if we could have our eyes open spiritually for about five seconds, I think we'd probably get a glimpse of what the tribulation might be, be, be like. <laughs> the constant warfare that has taken place, the spiritual warfare, you know, would certainly change our lives. You're rest assured that if you opt for short-term comfort, you are probably making some poor decisions that are going to bring about long-term suffering for you and your family. So we don't go by short-term comfort. Short-term comfort is not necessarily a bad thing. Like getting a good night's sleep. Would you say that's some short-term comfort? Uh, amen to that. Well, that's a, there's nothing wrong with that. And as a matter of fact, that's uh, that sets the stage for some longer-term benefits in the next day, right? <laughs> so you can know that you're on the right track spiritually when your short-term goals do not conflict in any way with your long-term goals in Christ. That's how you measure that. How vital it is for us to understand this. Whatever our short-term goals are, whether it's uh, uh, retirement, or whether it's uh, getting another car. I think uh, Brother Randy this morning during the uh, 
Sunday morning study. He was claiming a Jaguar for me. <laughs> Sunday morning study, but uh, you know. And, but again, you look at it. You know, there's some people I've heard. I heard a uh, minister say one time. I think he was dra- driving either a Jaguar or a Mercedes Benz, a passer, and he said. It's important for me to have a car like this because it makes a statement to the rest of the world that God can prosper his people. Mm. I thought that was stretching it just a little yeah, bit. Yeah, <laughs> you know? and, uh, but again, we go for the short, you look at the short term, everybody has short term goals, nothing wrong with that. But you can know that they're okay if they do not conflict with your long term goal or walk with Christ. Amen. And I mentioned it this, uh, this morning, you can kind of probably do a little bit of a self check on this by asking you, asking yourself rather, what your ultimate goal in this life is, and then working back from there. Probably most of us would say something along the line of, well, I want to walk with Christ throughout my life, or I want to spend eternity with Him. Those would all be good answers. I want to be in His presence always, uh, today and tomorrow, and for all of the morals, those those would be good answers. But you can work back from that, and you would probably have three to five major goals under your primary goal which would be, we'll just say the primary goal is being in a sound relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And then you'd have maybe three or five goals under that that would be in direct relation to that, such as I want my family to do well, or I want my marriage to do well, or I want my ministry to do well, and all of those things connected directly to our relationship with Christ. And so what you're doing is, in one sense, working back from that primary goal to make sure that your short-term goals are connected directly to that primary or major goal. If you're really serious about those aspirations, your short-term goals of comfort, happiness, joy, as opposed to uh, happiness uh, being joy, uh, security, all of those things will not conflict. They will complement each other. They will complement your primary goal of serving Christ. How many of you realize everything is connected? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ according to his word, how many of you know that everything is connected to him in what you do and what you say and where you go and all of your plans? And he is the first and last. He's the alpha and the omega of consideration in all of your short-term goals, right? Amen. At least he should be. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but let's just say your big long-term goal, like I say, is to spend eternity in the presence of God. It's sold in, sold in all of your sub-goals, such as some of the things that we talked about, purpose in life and so forth, fulfillment, will all be directly linked to that goal, that largest of goals. All of your short-term goals will then be linked to those sub-goals of family, purpose, ministry, and fulfillment. And so, as I've stated many times in many different studies, everything is connected. Yes. Everything. So whatever's going on in your life, good, bad, or in between, there's a reason for that. And that's that's a good thing because that means it can be traced. If everything is connected, let's say that things aren't going so well right now. I shared with you, uh, I was trying to think of, of who it was that I had uh, talked with yesterday at the backpack giveaway, and, and I happen to remember in one way, I wish I hadn't, but uh, as they were describing some of the things that were going on in their life, I thought to myself, their life is a wreck. It was just one thing after another, and I know this family fairly well, and I thought to myself, you know, there are reasons for that. Yeah. And I knew the reasons because I know them. And you know what? They also know the reasons. Sometimes we, things don't go so well, and maybe we brought that on ourselves by some bad decisions, bad choices. Don't get into a state of denial and say, no, that wasn't my fault because then you're enslaved by the circumstances. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you say, yeah, I made a bad choice there. Lord, help me recover from that. Show me a better way to do things. Then you're already on the road to, to getting stronger and better. Amen. The largest percentage of people will go another route, <clears throat> as described in verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead, we talked about it in Revelation 13, or in his hand, that technology, like I said, we've talked about it, that technology is there, has been there for a long time through uh, implantation. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. In other words, it's not diluted. 
It's not diluted. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, talking about those that did what's described in verse 9, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. The mark of the beast, as pronounced by this third angel, will in fact provide some short-term comfort for those in the tribulation period. But the price comes very high. In other words, they'll be able to barter and sell and buy and you know, get clean water and uh, uh, supposedly and food, clothing, shelter, all those things are in the tribulation, but they'll have to sell their soul to get it. Yeah. Tribulation is not going to be a place where anybody uh, is going to take the attitude, well, I can make it in the tribulation. I couldn't do it in this world. I'll make it during the tribulation time. That's not going to happen. In God's plan, he pays the price through the cross, right? Once and for all. No more sacrifices needed. Once and for all sacrifice. That's him paying the price. Any other way, the individual pays the price that he cannot afford. Because you and I are not qualified to pay that price for ourselves. Amen. And that price is described in verses 10 and 11, as we just read. That's the price of trying to uh, go on your own, go on any other way other than with Christ, go on any other way other than saying, I accept his sacrifice once and for all. But that's some long-term consequences. Of course, some very short-term comfort, if you want to call it that. See, this is an example of how some short-term goals, without considering the larger goal of who Christ is in your life, how that's going to have eternal impact. Any solution without God cannot truly be considered comfortable, ultimately. I mean, that's like, lasts about as long as the twinkling of an eye. You know, is there pleasure to sin? Yeah. Yes. yeah, there is pleasure to yes, say, right? Very, very Temporary. short. And there's also some severe long-term consequences for it, too, that goes on with all the confessed and repented of, right? Amen. What's being uh, referenced in verses 10 and 11 is the uh, white throne judgment of Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15, something that those that have been raptured individually or, or institutionally will witness, will be on hand to witness the white throne judgment of Revelation 20. It is overwhelming to think about that. Everyone, down through time, will be at the white throne judgment. And there will only be two places to be. There will be those that are there to witness the proceedings. And there will be those that are there not to be judged, because in one sense they've already judged themselves, but to have sentence enacted for the choices that they made. Those are the two arenas, if you will, of people that will actually be there. And it's, uh, again, uh, quite an overwhelming thing, at least it is for me to think that we'll be there to witness all of that, every bit of it. The last part of uh, verse 10 is interesting. It says, be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The long-term consequences of these short-term decisions poorly made will be witnessed by the Lamb and the attending angels. But the followers of Christ in this life will also be there, as I mentioned. Witnesses to what? We are witness to witness that God always, 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 you only have to put one always in the blank. <laughs> but God always keeps his word. Yes, he does. That's what we'll be witness to. He will not violate his word, even though some would say, you know, I'm, I'm standing under the mercy of God, even though I'm not really doing those things that I know I should be doing or I'm doing some things I shouldn't be. But we will witness the fact that central to all that he does is his willingness to let every person make their own choice regarding, regarding short-term and long-term goals. Amen. And so this will be a completion of that. This is him keeping his word. I, I allowed you the privilege of making your own choice. I told you what the consequences would be, and now this is what's taking place. So for now, he offers to help us reconcile and achieve those short-term goals by showing us how better long-term goals are the keys to a rich life. 
and do not need to con conflict with what we want in the here and now. Amen. Verses uh, 9 through 11, we read them. Revelation 14 are difficult to digest spiritually. But in witnessing these proceedings later, we will understand the choices and decisions were made by everyone as a privilege of creation. Verses 12 and 13. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, I'm in verse 13, write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. So these are also a statement to us now as to how verses 9 through 11 can be completely avoided. We've got to exercise for strength, that is patience, in the here and now by being faithful guardians or keepers of the personal testimony or commandments of the living God. And so we do that in the here and now. What's being talked about is in verses 12 and 13, those that die from henceforth or ones that are being martyred during the tribulation. If, in reading Revelation, we know that there have been those that have already been martyred and have been recognized by Christ before the throne of grace. So it's being talked about as those that are will be converted during the tribulation time. We know that there will be preachers or evangelists that are also converted during the tribulation that actually preach the gospel. You can also see, as we read here, starting in verse 6, that the angel is going forth and also preaching the gospel, so there will be those that will hear. I don't believe there will be many. I believe that, that all will hear, but not many will actually receive it, and then will see, uh, stand by it uh, through the long, longer term. This uh, verse, verse 13, if we're listening, that type of lifestyle is confirmed daily through the Word of God. Like I said, we just uh, read it about the aspect of... Uh, Faith in Christ, commandments of God, the type of faith that's being talked about there is not just a faith of saying, oh yeah, I acknowledge God as God, and oh yeah, I acknowledge Christ's sacrifice, you know, for me. It's, it's more than that. It's, it's uh, essentially living your life and saying, I agree with God's word. Amen. That's the type of faith that's being talked about here. And then also, if you agree with God's word, then there is evidence of that. And that's the type of faith that's being mentioned. So this verse also refers to those that have been martyred during the tribulation period, as stated. But it still has application in the contemporary setting. People that struggle with the concept of works or living in a holy, sanctified way are setting themselves up for major disappointment. Mm -hmm. Amen. Ministries that mislead their people on this matter of works are condemning their people to difficult days ahead. The fact is that what we are working at speaks for itself. Our works do follow us. In other words, what we're involved in brings results. So there are just the choices that we make, there are natural consequences to that. Hopefully they're good ones. We're involved in the work of God and we're connecting everything to that. Then we're having results and our works are actually following us. The wording, I think, is uh, so important. It means that the efficiency of our lives works. Where we get the word ergonomics. So the efficiency of our lives, how well our lives work, is an ever-attendant evidence of statement or statement about what we believe. Amen. What we follow. You don't even have to try. This is an automatic. So if we're involved in that which is spiritually efficient or ergonomics, which God's works and word are always efficient and ergonomic, if you will. In other words, they function well. They function to perfection. We know that that's true. So again, the, you don't even really have to try because if you're involved in the things of God, then you're going to get the results that you want. Our works follow us. The fact is, we don't have to judge each other. You know, for me, maybe I should just speak for myself on that. I don't feel like I'm qualified to do that. Amen. Because I don't, I don't know what's going on in your heart and mind. Not truly. I mean, there's evidences of it because you know them by their fruit, right? I think yes. Sister Kim had said that in our last study. You know them by their fruit. So there are some evidences, but ultimately, you can't know what's going on with me at the deepest level. So we stay away from that. Uh, the reality is that there are only 
two that are qualified to judge you. You and the living God. Amen. And I would say, if you judge yourself, to judge your heart and mind, be wise and ask the Holy Spirit to check your work. Amen. Because it's likely that you and I may miss a spot or two. Right. And the Holy Spirit will say, well, pretty good job, but there's a couple of areas over here that you need to look at. Sure. If only we would judge ourselves in the here and now, we would do well in the later and forever. 1 Corinthians 11, 31, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. So next time we're going to talk about the initial move toward the second coming of Christ, a distinct event from the rapture of the church. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, mm -hmm. I thank you for each person here right now. It's no coincidence uh, that we've come together. Such things do not exist for the person that is following you because our steps are ordered when we follow you. And so when we walk in righteousness and we strive to do that which is pleasing to you, then our steps are well ordered and that means we've got direction, purpose, and goals. We've got fulfillment in life. So Lord, I thank you for each person here. Help us to review these scriptures in our hearts and minds to delve in deeply into your word that is time well spent so that we can get the full understanding. Holy Spirit, we need your help with this. And so, Lord, I just uh, thank you for each person here. Lord, we thank you for the Corbett's and them taking the time to visit with us, longtime friends. And, Lord, I just pray that uh, your hand of mercy and travel mercy and guidance would be on them, that the, uh, the way ahead would be clear for them, and that uh, the path would be smooth as only you can make it. So, Lord, I just thank you for each one here. This time of fellowship is always sweet. I thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us today in the morning service and our evening study during our worship time. Lord, let us receive it as a commission. Should you decide to tarry, to go forth in strength and confidence in you. We thank you, Lord, for this. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. 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 All right. May each one of you go to peace. Greet each other. Have a little fellowship before you go. Make sure you...